Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today's conversation is kind of a supplement to an earlier talk that I had given on Edward Said's concept of worldliness. And I felt that I wasn't really specific enough in that, so I thought I should do a supplemental conversation about that. And I will start by reading from page 35, where he gets into the discussion of worldliness. And what he's talking about is that he's trying to argue that I read texts as if they exist in the world, for, but for a lot of critics, especially those who believe in stylistics, and he refers to Michael Refertier's work, The Self-Sufficient Text. And he's saying, well, you know, he may argue that, that the text cannot or should not be reduced to its circumstantial contingencies, right? And what Said is saying is, and I quote, is the alternative to the various fallacies only a hermetic textual cosmos, once whose significant dimension of meaning is, as Refertier says, a wholly inward or intellectual one? Is there no way of dealing with a text and its worldly circumstances fairly? No way to grapple with the problems of literary language except by cutting them off from the more plainly urgent ones of everyday worldly language, right? So the question, of course, that he's trying to then answer by his discussion of worldliness is to find a way to engage with a text where we are engaged with the text itself, but we are not seeking the meanings of the text only within the text, right? We are placing it in the world. And in order to do that, he goes to a source from medieval Arabic linguistic philosophy, a list of medieval Arabic Muslim grammarians, right? And it is important to read and then discuss that part, and then we will understand why is he arguing for worldliness, and why is he going to this medieval Arabic source? And that's what I want to highlight in this particular conversation. So after sharing with us that he has found a source from an unmentioned place, right, from 11th century Andalusia, the Arab scholars, Arab grammarians, which will enable us to understand this debate between the text containing its own meanings and the text being in the world and that context also lending some credence to the meanings. That's why he is going there to retrieve these grammarian. And what he says is, during the 11th century in Andalusia, there existed a remarkably sophisticated and unexpectedly prophetic school of Islamic philosophic grammarians, whose polemics anticipate 20th century debates between structuralists and generative grammarians, between descriptivists and behaviorists. Nor is this all. One small group of these Andalusian linguists directed its energies against the tendencies amongst rival linguists to turn the, turn the question of meaning in language into esoteric and allegorical exercises. Among the group were three linguists and theoretical grammarians, Ibn Hazm, Ibn Jini, and Ibn Mada al Qurtobi, all of whom worked in Cordoba during the 11th century, all belonging to the Zahirite school, all antagonists of the Batinist school. Batinists held that meaning in language is concealed within the words. Meaning is therefore available only as the result of an inward tending exegesis. The Zahirites, their name derives from the Arabic word for clear, 
apparent, zahir, right? and phenomenal. Batin connotes internal, argued that words had only a surface meaning, one that was anchored to a particular usage, circumstance, historical, and religious situation. Let's dwell on it a little on the Zahirites and Batinist school of thought. Now, Said is picking it up when the debate has already reached Andalusia, which is the Muslim Spain in 11th century. Do keep in mind that the Zahiriya Bataniya debate was also happening in Baghdad, right? And there it was happening within the context of religious exegesis, right? And Batanites under the Abbasid Empire, right, were considered a very dangerous sect. These are the people who were the followers of Hassan ibn Sabah, who become the assassins and later become the Ismailiya sect. Of, of Shiaism, right? So the difference between the Zahiriya and Bataniya was, and Bataniya were also called uh, Talimi, that they believed that Quran could not just be read as it is, that there were hidden meanings behind it, and that only a learned few could initiate you into those hidden meanings. And that is how they then would entice normal Muslims to get into this secret learning and then become part of the Bataniya movement, right? The Zahirites, on the other hand, believed that whatever is in front of you, if you know the language, because the Quran, Quran says, I am easy to understand, and that whatever meaning are apparent in the text, and what they mean in the world is the meaning of the text. But the Batanite way of thinking was so considered so dangerous that the second Abbasid Caliph actually commissions Al-Ghazali to write a book that refutes all Batanite claims. And you can read it, it's available in translation, and I'll post the link in the description. So this is the larger background of the debate between the Zahiriya and Bataniya that he is invoking here, right? And the reason is what he's trying to suggest is that the Bataniya school of thought probably corresponds to all those critical scholars, linguists who believe that the meaning of a text is in the words, and if you knew more intricacies of their etymologies and their uses within the text, the meaning would reveal itself, right? And that the text contains its meaning in, in itself. But against that, what he's saying is, let's go to the Zahiriya mode, which enables us to place the text within its own original historical context. But also, we can approach the text from the current context of the world in which it is being read and consumed. So that's why he is taking this detour into medieval Muslim philosophy is to give new tools to critics by suggesting here is some knowledge that you can bring with you and it can bear upon the current debates of, of whether or not the meaning is in the text or the text exists in the world and the world lends it, it lends it its meaning, right? For a lot of post-colonial scholars, this is an instructive moment in Said because it teaches us that we don't just go to historical texts from our own culture simply to prove that we were once great and we thought great things, no. But we go there to retrieve our philosophies, our works, our cosmological explanations of truth, and then bring it to bear, right, on contemporary theory, on contemporary ways of looking at the text, and that's how we will complicate the metropolitan monopoly over historical as well knowledge and literary vocabularies and theories. So that's an, another important thing to keep in mind here. After discussing briefly the works of the Bataanite scholars who focused on the very text of the Quran itself, 
he then goes to the Zahirite scholars and on to their intervention into reading the same text, the Quran. And he uh, goes peculiarly to Ibn Hazm's work, right? And he explains it pretty well, though a little briefly. But here is the project of the Zahirite scholarship that he talks about. The Zahirite effort was, and I'm quoting here, to restore by rationalization a system of reading a text in which attention was focused on the phenomenal worlds themselves, in what might be considered their once and for all sense uttered for and during a specific occasion, not on hidden meanings they might later be supposed to contain. The Cardovan Zahirites in particular went very far in trying to provide a reading system that placed the tightest, tightest possible control over the reader and his circumstance. They did this principally by means of a theory of what a text is. So in order to theorize how to read a text in this world, right? The Zahirite scholars, of course, first give a theory of what, did, what do they mean by the text? How are they defining the Quran? And what he says is, so a very important place is given to what Roger Arnaldes, who translated Ibn Hazm, calls human factors in the reception, transmission, and understanding of such a text. Now, do keep in mind that for Muslim theologians, Quran was an event. So what they meant by it is that it wasn't something that was composed by various people over time. No, it was an event because it was revealed instantaneously to Prophet Muhammad. So that's the distinction between the Bible and the Quran, and hence, the first and the foremost thing to acknowledge in Quranic exegesis is that Quran is the ultimate expression of God's will, right? That's why it is called Kalimatullah, the word of God, right? Now, in his study of Ibn Hazm, and this is Said, Arnaldes puts his description of the Quran in the following terms. And this is Said repeating how Ibn Hazm had defined Quran. The Quran speaks of historical events, yet it is not itself historical. It repeats past events, which it condenses and particularizes, yet is not itself an actually and lived experience. It ruptures the human continuity of life, yet God does not enter temporality by a sustained or concerted act. The Quran evokes the memory of actions whose con content repeat itself eternally in ways identical with itself as warnings, orders, imperatives, punishments, rewards. Okay, so this is a particular definition of the Quran and then the Zahirite position adopts a view of the Quran that is absolutely circumstantial without at the same time making that worldliness dominate the actual sense of the text. So the text is outworldly and it's an event, but its reading is in the world. That is the important thing that they are trying to say. All this is the ultimate avoidance of vulgar determinism in the Zahirite position. And then Said goes to Ibn Hazm, right? In Ibn Hazm's linguistic theory is based upon an analysis of the imperative mode of the Quran, the Amr, right? And he says there are two paradigms at play in, in the Quran, Ikra, when it is read or recited, and Kul, when it tells you something. Since those imperatives obviously control the circumstantial and historical appearance of the Quran, and since they must also control uses of the text thereafter, Ibn Hazm connects his analysis of the imperative mode with the juridical notion of Had, 
a word meaning both a logical grammatical definition and a limit, the plural of which is hadud. A word meaning what transpires in the imperative mode between the injunctions to read and write is the deliri delivery of an utterance, khabar, right? Which is the verbal realization of a signifying intention or niya, niyat in Urdu. Now the signifying intention is synonymous not with a psychological intention but exclusively with a verbal intention, itself something highly worldly. It takes place exclusively in the world. It is occasional and circumstantial in both a very precise and a wholly pertinent way. Okay, so how are they defining the text? How is Ibn Hazm defining the Quran? He's not taking away from the Quran its divinity. And he is also still insisting that Quran is an event, right? That it was revealed instantaneously, right? But what he's saying is that what the Quran creates is certain things that we need to read, certain things that we recite. It has imperatives in it. It tells us what to do, what not to do, and it also tells us how to read it. And in that reading, what transpires is knowledge, khabar, that comes to me and you when we read it. But the meaning of the text depends on our intention, on our niya, how we read it. That means me, myself, I'm a party to an act of reading and meaning making, right? And if my intention is involved there, right, then the act of reading the sacred book is worldly, right? Because I am engaged with it. I am listening to the Amr, to the injunction, and then trying to understand it. That is what makes the Quranic exegesis in the Zahiriya tradition worldly, right? He is going to bring this back to the present. And how does he do that? And because the Quran, which is the paradigmatic case of divine and human language, is a text that incorporates speaking and writing, reading and telling, Zahirite interpretation itself accepts as inevitable, not the separation between speech and writing, not the, the disjunction between a text and its circumstantiality, but rather their necessary interplay. It is the interplay, the constitutive interaction that makes possible this sphere Zahirite notion of meaning. By this knowledge then, he is now going to argue and support as to why does he consider the texts are worldly and how does he do that? I have very quickly summarized an enormously complex theory for which I cannot claim any particular influence in Western European literature since the Renaissance and perhaps not even in Arabic literature since the Middle Ages. But what ought to strike us forcibly about the whole theory is that it represents a concept articulated thesis for dealing with the text as significant form in which, and I put this as carefully as I can, worldliness, circumstantiality, the text status as an event having sensuous particularity as well as historical contingency are considered as being incorporated in the text an infringible part of its capacity for conveying and producing meaning. This means, and this is still said, that a text has a specific situation, placing restraints upon the interpreter and his interpretation, not because the situation is hidden within the text as a mystery, but rather because the situation exists at the same level of surface particularity as the textual object itself. So that, in a sense, is a kind of my supplementary conversation about my conversation about worldliness. Now, how does it apply to the Quranic exegesis? If, if you have read the Quran and, and the footnotes are there in it, but do keep in mind that always 
one way of understanding the Quran is totally extra textual. And that is to understand when during the lifetime of the Prophet was a certain chapter, certain surah of the Quran revealed. Because if you don't keep in mind that extra textual knowledge, you can sometimes completely misconstrue the message because you're not importing it in a certain textual temporality within which those verses were revealed. A great example of that is Surah At-Tawbah. Two verses from that surah that they use and one of them is always translated as and kill the idolaters, right? Now the, the reason they can mobilize it because they say here it's written in the text. This text tells them to do this, right? Now the only way Muslims can respond to that and I did that in one of my articles, right? on jihad and I will post a link to the description is by first of all pointing out to the extra textual Zahiriya information about the context of the surah that it was one of the last surahs to reveal towards the end. Historically that was the moment when all efforts at peace with the Quraysh by Prophet Muhammad and his followers had been exhausted when they had broken treaties right and the final moment had reached where Muslims were now asked to rise up because everything has failed. So not only that surah then by implanting it within its temporality of revelation teach you what to do and what must have happened before you go to a state of war, right? But it also tells you this is not the first lesson that the Quran tells you. Quran is implanted in a certain temporality and it is contextual to that history as to what was happening in the Muslim's life. And this was a response to that situation. Only a Zahiriya reading will then retrieve Muslim knowledges and Islam, which cannot be universalized as a permanent injunction to kill or to destroy non-Muslims, right? That is the implication here. So he's taking this knowledge, Saeed, and teaching us, here is how with this knowledge of exegesis from medieval Arab grammarians from Andalusia who are called Zahirites, we can claim that the text can be both. It can contain its own meaning and its own temporality but instead of looking for hidden secrets in the text, we must also place it within the context in which it was revealed or constructed. Or what do my inten intention, my nia, right? Maybe my ideology brings to an act of reading. And all of that then suggests that a text and an act of reading and interpreting it is worldly. It exists in the world. And if we acknowledge that, then that creates a space for us to read texts differently because they exist in the world, right? They were constructed in the world, they are consumed in the world, they are interpreted in the world, and the reader, his or herself, is also constructed in the material world. So this, I hope, augments the brief conversation that I had recorded and which is available to you on worldliness. I do highly recommend that you should read the book, especially this chapter, and then maybe that would give you a much better grasp of the concept of worldliness. I hope this was useful to you. Uh, I certainly learned a lot in rereading uh, the world, the text, the critic, but thank you so much for encouraging me to learn these things more carefully again and I'm delighted for that and I'm grateful to you for encouraging me to do that. Please stay safe, take care of yourselves, take care of others and I will now as always see you next time and until then peace and love.